What do you call those little moments that change your life? I'm not talking about the big epiphanies we have. I'm not talking about the big disasters that change your life from one day to the next. I'm talking about the small little things that nudge you in a certain direction. The small little boulders in the stream that change the way things would normally be and turn your life, sometimes to the worse, sometimes to the better. I'm here today to talk to you about the Isle of Man Coat Club. That's something that's been running, something that's been hugely successful. But there are a number of points in my life that led up to this. And I wanted to share those with you first, because they make a fantastic story. So, but before I start, just want to tell you a bit more about Code Club. Code Club is an organization that's been set up on the Isle of Man to help teach people, help teach kids especially, how to code. There was also designed as a focal point for people who find coding fun, people who work in coding, to come and share what they know with others, find their peers, and find other people to talk about their hobby. We've been quite lucky. There's a number of volunteers who contribute to this. But the great thing about them is that they all share a passion. They all share a passion for IT. I found my passion for IT at the tender age of 13. My dad was a teacher, and he, as, as a teacher, he had a couple of rowdy kids in class one day, and they were messing around with a couple of magazines, and he confiscated these magazines and got them home. There were two computer magazines, they were American magazines, and they were filled of stuff, with stuff I had never read about before. This was the 80s, early 80s, so we didn't have computing at school, I didn't have a computer at home. Um, so I started reading about these devices, and I found them more and more fascinating. I read those magazines cover to cover, over and over and over again. Destroy them. Totally. So, I used to go out to the library, so I took the opportunity, I snuck down to the adult section, and I borrowed as many computer books as I could. And I remember those early days where you'd read through these books and you'd understand 5% of them. But I persevered, I kept reading, I kept reading, I kept reading, up to a point where, where everything started making sense, and I started to get really good at this. I had nagged my parents for years, and eventually they bought me a computer, so I had a computer too, but again, we didn't have any computers at school. We had computers at sixth form in a lab, and there I started meeting people who had the same interest I had. And what happened over there was there was this really interesting turning point where something I was interested in was something that interested other people. There were people around me who wanted to hear the things that I knew. And that knowledge turned into a passion. And I'm extremely lucky today because technology has become really, really important in our lives. And the fact that I enjoy doing this, the fact that I enjoy talking about this, has given me a fantastic opportunity to help people, help organizations around me. So that was one small moment. Those magazines just changed what I'm doing today. The second moment I want to talk about was when I was working in the UK in an IT consultancy. Um, the company I worked in was bigger than the ones I had worked in before. They had induction processes, they had appraisal processes. And there was one particular moment that sticks in my mind where I had an appraisal, and my line manager described me as a people person. Now, I would never have thought of myself as a people person. I was a techie. So why is this mentor of mine calling me a... a, a, a um, why is this person calling me a people person? And I started looking at what I was doing. Yes, what I, the job I was doing was very technical, but I was also helping bridge a gap between people who didn't understand what these things did. I was very good at conversing with people, at explaining what, how things work. And this skill really stood out, and this person pointed it out to me. Again, this changed what I did with my life later on when I was looking at doing a master's. I could have done an MSc in computing, which would have been easy. Or I had a choice of doing an MBA, which was harder, but much more valuable for me. And I found that the tools, the knowledge, the people I met during this MBA were instrumental to the way my life um, kept going on from then on. So yeah, just one statement, you're a people person. And that gave me the direction that I took. The third moment I want to speak about is a place I visited a couple of years ago. It's a place called Singularity University. Singularity University is an organization that focuses on exponential technologies and looks at the way that these can be used to further humanity, to deal with the, with the problems we face every day. It was a fantastic experience. I met a lot of interesting people. 
And one person stuck in my mind. This person was from Colombia, and her life was completely different to mine. She worked in an educational charity, and the stories she was telling us, the big problem they have in Colombia is corruption. And it's not uncommon to hear stories of somebody who's working at what they're passionate about, building a school in a particular area, for example. And because what they want to do conflicts with something that some rich person um, wanted to do, like redevelop that estate, this person would suddenly disappear overnight and nobody would hear from them again. Can you imagine living in that environment? But Singularity was a big change for me. It opened my eyes to a lot of things. But there was a little tiny point that made me decide to go to Singularity. I went to Singularity thanks to a contest that was being run in the Isle of Man, the Isle of Man Grand Challenge. And I remember ooming and eyeing whether I should go for this contest. It's going to take some of my time. It's going to be pressure on me. And there was a point where my wife said, just do it. And yes, she did say, just do it. But what she really meant was, just do it. Even if you fail, I still love you. <laughs> there was a small, tiny point that literally changed what I was doing. But that statement gave me the strength I needed to make change the strength I needed to look at myself and see how can I improve, like how can I be better. It's a third moment. Came back from Singularity, wanted to do something, kept speaking to people about Code Club, and it happened to be that there were a number of people who had similar ideas, but nobody had taken action, nobody had done anything. And there was one conversation that made this happen for me. I was speaking with a friend and colleague, Kurt, um, and he asked me the question, what do you need? At that point, my immediate answer was, I need computers, I need space, I knew I had volunteers, I knew I had people who would help. But looking at that statement, examining that statement later, what do you need? I realized that what I had been looking for was permission from someone to say, yes, do this. Look at me, I'm 40 years old and I'm looking for permission to do stuff. It sounds really stupid when you say it that way, but in reality, I could have done this, anybody could have done this. But everybody was looking at everybody else, waiting for them, waiting for someone to give them permission. I guess what that gave me was the courage to make change, the courage to set it all up. So, the first step of Code Club was we started speaking to people. I asked for people who were, if, if anyone wanted to volunteer. We put out an ad in the paper. Does anybody want us to set up a Code Club on Ireland? And the first time we met, there were around 50, 60 people standing in a room which should really have accommodated a max of 40. Besides the fact that it was a fire hazard, it also meant that what I had planned for the day just wouldn't work. So we said, what we did is a really bad photo over there. But that photo was a whiteboard where I asked people to scribble, what do you want to learn about? And that really solidified what we wanted to do. That photo on the right hand side over there was the first time we met, and there's some kids over there starting to play. We modeled this on a code club that was happening in the UK. So the UK code club provided us with materials and lessons that we could actually deliver to kids. So that was the first step that we did. Um, the change over there, however, is that the code club in the UK tends to happen once they run a set of lessons and that's the end of it. There's another set of lessons, but everything is very disjointed. And what I wanted to create was something that met regularly, once a week on a Saturday between four and six, and had all sorts of activities for, for young kids, for older people who wanted to learn more about IT. So what happened was we started developing other offerings. So again, there's my son Arthur over there, and those are what our scratch classes look like. We started de developing other offerings. There's a very interesting space called um, Makerspace. And what they do is they, they talk to people and they encourage people to make things. Now if you think about coding, Coding is about making a program, building a program. And we can all pick up our phones and download an app for, for a dollar, for two dollars if we want to. But we can also write that app. And that's what the whole coding idea is about. Making is similar, but in a physical space. So we use things like 3D printers, for example, to actually make things. We use Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, small computers to actually create things that can do stuff. And the person on the left over here, over there, Dan, is one of, the, one of the volunteers we have who really inspired me to set up Code Club. His idea was that he loves this stuff so much that if somebody provides him with a space to do it, he'll just do it. 
And I'm immensely grateful to all the volunteers who help us through what we're doing. But the fantastic thing about them is they're all extremely passionate about what they do. They're the sort of people who, if they had nothing to do, would sit in their garage on a Sunday and mess around with this stuff. <laughs> so all we're doing is bringing them together and helping them show other people what they're, what they're passionate about, what they enjoy doing, so that they can share this with the world. So we grew and we grew and we grew. And up to this point in 18 months, we've got around three, 400 kids who we've trained who keep coming back to learn more things, which, which to me is a fantastic success. Um, we've been running robotic sessions also. That's what that picture down on the bottom, bottom right is showing over there, which looks quite messy. Uh, but again, Rob, um, we use Lego Mindstorms to help kids build something from Lego, which they can write a program to animate. And recently, we ran a contest. So on the left-hand side, the weather is Holly, who's nine. We ran what we call the National Robotics Contest. So we invited everyone in the Isle of Man, all the schools, to take part in this. Um, Holly, this nine-year-old, won this contest and won a fantastic prize that Blue Wave gave us. We're also doing other things. On the top right over there, there's the cybersecurity team. We're taking part in a UK contest um, where we have a number of challenges, a number of cybersecurity challenges. And we're doing quite well, considering that we had no preparation for this and we're competing with people who study this at school. Bottom right, there is a code bus. That's actually a point of presence. We can take around the island, we can visit schools. It's got 4G, it's got a generator. We can sit in the middle of a field and teach people coding if we want to. <laughs> so, what does the future hold? Uh, we're currently uh, engaged on another project to build what's called the Fab Lab. Fab Lab stands for, it's a digital fabrication lab, and it's all about this idea of making, this idea of creating. We're gonna have electronics in there, we're gonna have Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, but we're also gonna have traditional making things, like woodwork, like metalwork, which pe pe some people might have access to, but others might not. We're also going to have an event space in there, and this is a facility down in the south that the factory um, has given us to make use for the space. We're using volunteers to build this, um, and we're expecting it to be come online next year, and that will be the new home for Code Club. So, these kids that we're working with, these people that we're working with, have a long road ahead of them. And there's a number of things that will help them along this road. Passion's gonna help them, direction's gonna help them, strength is gonna help them, courage is gonna help them. Now, I'm not going to be conceited enough to say that we can give them these four things with what we're doing. But as parents, as educators, we hope that these have these things. What I'm trying to do with Code Club is to try and create a tiny spark, a tiny change in their life that will help them realize there's something out there, that will help them find whether they have a passion for something or not, as it may be, that will help them set directions so that in the future they'll be the best they could be, both for themselves and for the world around them. Thank you.